Hello and welcome to part 5 of Let's Translate Light Novels, where we will be looking at Seiran Den, the light novel that is the prequel to the Shigeyuki series. And I'm going to critique translation submissions from some of my patrons. So if you want to have your translations of this light novel critiqued in these very videos, you can join my Patreon at the $12 tier, and I will send you the materials in advance, and then you can have your go at translating them, and perhaps I will critique them in these episodes if you want. At this moment in time, I'd like to go ahead and thank all the patrons who support this and other series on my channel. In particular, I would like to thank Greg, Lay, Henry Roaming, Charpixie, and Datafox. Before we continue, I need to go over a little disclaimer. The objective of this series is not to walk away with a finished translation of this novel. In actual fact, we're probably only going to get through the first several pages. The purpose of this series is to teach Japanese grammar and vocabulary. Additionally, the series objective is to show how you can take your understanding of Japanese and turn it into a proper translation. To demonstrate this, I'll be comparing and contrasting translations of this novel that I did in the year 2000, when I was at the intermediate level and completely new to translating, with translations from some of my patrons, as well as my insights today as a professional translator with over 15 years experience. I do not own the rights to Seiran Den, and I did not get permission from the author, Nishizaki Megumi, to translate it. So again, I would like to emphasize that the intention of this video series is not to produce a translation of this book, but to teach Japanese and to show how translation can be done. I won't be naming my patrons who have contributed their translations in these videos, but I will credit them in the video description if they wish. And now, on to the video. Alright, let's just jump into this, <laughs> trying to keep this video under 45 minutes. Oh, my sweet summer child. Okay, Sarah from the future speaking, and yeah, one of my patrons sent me a translation literally as I was recording this video, so I felt bad that I didn't get to include it in the filming, so I'm going to add it in now in post. Matuta wa doko ka toku miru yo na me o shita. Doko ka, somewhere, toku miru yo na me o shita. So, this yo na again. Um, again, it's making it sort of like a, it's a simile. Tokumiru, uh, looking out into the distance, meoshita. Uh, so her eyes, uh, she, she made eyes, meoshita, she had eyes that looked as though they were looking off into the distance. Mada, niju hassai no kagayaku bakari no sono utsukushii kao ga maru de jiudai no otome no yo ni adokenaku mieta. So, mada niju hassai, still 28 years old, no kagayaku bakari no Sono utsukushi kao ga. So that beautiful face of hers, um, who that shined, um, that was just all all sparkles, kangayaku bakari. Um, and her she's still 28 years old. So that still 28-year-old face of hers that was all sparkles. <laughs> uh Marude was almost as if it was um Judai no Otome. So Otome is a virgin <laughs> or a maiden. There, there's many different ways you can translate that word. Um, but yeah, like a young, a young maiden, I would say. Uh, Judai no, a, a maiden in her teens. I would just say a young maiden personally. I think it sounds a little more romantic. And that's kind of what this, this sentence is going for. No yo ni. Uh, so again, another, another analogy here. No yo ni, no yo na. Adokenaku mieta. So adokenai is like um, young and innocent. Adokenaku uh, would be like young li, innocent li, mieta. So it, it appeared, it looked as though it was uh, young and innocent, just like a girl in her teens, basically. Um, so patron A translated this as Matuta looked into the distance. Her beautiful face, still shining at the age of 28, had the look of an innocent teenage girl. Correct. Again, I think we're going for a little more flowery uh, language here, and this is a little bit more like narrate like, I'm gonna give you the facts about Matuta. <laughs> Maturu, again, patron B misread um, the ta of Matuta as du, and just kept that typo throughout. Uh, Matuta stared off into the distance. So Matuta looked into the distance versus Matu Matuta stared off into the distance. I think I kind of like stared off. Uh, doko ka toku. Doko ka, it makes it kind of vague. It's like, oh, she kind of stared off into the distance versus looked into the distance, which implies more like I am like looking and focusing into the distance. Ah, there's a castle over there versus staring off into the distance implies more like, you know, <laughs> just, it has a little bit of a different nuance to it, you can see. Although she was 28 years of age herself, she looked innocent enough as though she were in her late teens, exclamation point. I don't know about the exclamation point there. Uh, I would just make that a period. Uh, it was not an exclamation point in the Japanese, and I don't really think it warrants an exclamation point. 
Um, I don't know about the, although she was 28 years of age herself part, uh, I don't know about the herself. Although she was 28 years of age, she looked innocent enough as though she were in her late teens. And again, though, this marude as though, you want to watch that, that tendency to translate no yona and no yoni as as though, as if. Um, you don't always want to keep that in English. Um, she looked as though she were in her late teens. Yeah, sono utsukushi kawol was also left out there. She looked innocent. It's rather, she's beautiful. Um, that part, that information was left out a little bit. Uh, we still can kind of get the general point across here. Uh, patron C. Matuta looked up as if there were something off in the distance. It, it's not quite that. It's more like she just, she kind of stared. Doko ka? It's like, ah, uh, somewhere vaguely off into the distance. Yo na meoshita. She was kind of, it looked like she was just sort of looking off into the distance. Her face, still beautiful and radiant. And I think this is sort of like tying in uh, with the last part, part four. She she had just said that very poignant line about her son. As time goes by, you will grow into a splendid young man. I'm sure of it. You'll be a man stronger than any other, more loving than any other. And then as she says this, she's kind of like looking off into the distance because she's kind of thinking about that. Yeah, when my little boy grows up, he's going to be such a great man. He's going to be stronger and more be and more like kinder and more loving than anyone else. And that's what this narration is kind of going with, the mood of when she said that line. So it's not like she suddenly looks off into the distance. It's rather she's kind of dreamily thinking about her son growing up into a really wonderful man. So it's rather she stared off into the distance. I think that that makes a lot more sense. Her face still beautiful and radiant. I like that for Kagayaku Bakari, radiant. That's a really good translation of that. I was like, sparkly. <laughs> it's not literally sparkly. Radiant is good. At 28 years of age, had the innocence of a teen girl. I kind of like that. Had the innocence of a teen girl. She looked innocent enough is more like she looked innocent enough that she didn't steal that man's wallet, <laughs> you know, rather than she had the innocence of a teen girl, the innocent purity, <laughs> otome, virgin, young maiden. Okay, and now we have the contribution from Patron D. So Patron D did a lot of like rearranging of um, where dialogue tags and things go to kind of make everything flow a little better in more naturally in English. So as you'll see, Patron D inserted, um, they, they split up this section here that we're looking at in Japanese. The dark pink areas are basically the Japanese section we're looking at and the light pink section in the middle is the line that came right before that in Japanese. So the very last line in Let's Translate Light Novels Part 4. I really shouldn't have split up these videos where I did. I should have done it like a little bit sooner. So as you, can, as you see, Matuta herself was 28, but her face still had the innocent glow of a girl ready for marriage. So I like innocent glow. I like, so patron D's innocent glow and uh, patron C's beautiful and radiant. I really like those, those words. Doesn't have the beautiful. I guess it doesn't necessarily need beautiful. I mean, all these other words are doing a lot of work. So patron D also added footnotes to their translation and they made a footnote about the ready for marriage part. I'll just read you their footnote. There might be better choices of words here, depending on what the rest of the text suggests about this village's sexual and marital norms. Teenager definitely feels like too much of a modernism in English though. And yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I, I do think that like Judai, usually in, in modern Japanese, you would translate that as someone in their teens. Like it literally means somebody in their tens. <laughs> it's like 10, you know, the kanji for 10, not teen necessarily. But yeah, teens is is a bit of a modernism. And this book and the, the whole like vibe of the writing style of this book is a little more classical. So yeah, like teen is a bit modern. A girl ready for marriage. Um, I'd say, yeah, probably like with, with their society, it, it's not a very far off choice. And then this patron included the quote uh, f that came before this. Uh, she giggled, you'll grow into a fine young man in no time, the strongest of men, the gentlest of men. And then this next part of this section is sort of the dialogue tag for that. Her eyes were looking past him now, focused on something unseen far away. And then there was another footnote here that this patron had so many footnotes. It, it's actually really nice for this particular exercise. Like in a translation, you would not want to have all of these footnotes, obviously, but like for this exercise, footnotes are perfectly acceptable. So the footnote they put for this part was, I'm trying to make it clear here that she's not just distracted by watching Talia walk in or something. So I'm putting a bit more emphasis 
emphasis on this point than the original text did. I'm assuming there's a later plot point, something about Ayudu's father, that this is going to tie into and justify the emphasis. And yeah, this is true. And as I was saying, like some of the other patrons got a little bit tripped up, I think, with the wording of um, staring off into the distance. They, I, I think they might have thought that the reason why she was staring off was because Talia, spoiler alert, <laughs> Talia, this new character, is going to be at the door. And I think people got tripped up. Some of the other patrons got tripped up by that and thought, oh, the reason why she's staring off into the distance is because Talia is at the door, when actually she's she's staring off into the distance, dreamily thinking about what Ayudu is going to be like when he grows up. Uh, anyway, I like her eyes were looking past him now uh, to word that she's staring off into the distance. So, you know, she was talking to him, but now she's talking more about him and thinking about his future self. So his eyes were looking past him now is a good way of wording uh, uh, focused on something unseen far away. Yeah, they're, they're just really hammering that home. Um, it might be a little wordy to say her eyes were looking past him now, focused on something unseen far away. It could, it could just be her eyes were focused on something unseen now far away or something like that. And again, there was a drastic rewording, uh, reworking of the structure of this, uh, which is, it, it's totally acceptable. You can do that. Uh, depending on where um, that you'll grow into a fine young man in no time, the strongest of men, the gentlest of men line falls, you might word the part that comes after that uh, differently. But yeah, a little overly wordy after that, but it, it still sounds, it, it has that nice like romantic, poetic sort of um, feeling that this section uh, really needs to have. As I said, this is a big like foreshadowy moment um, that, that does uh, come up later uh, in the book. Um, and then she says, Ara! Matuta ga uh, ie no iriguchi no hou ni sono kao o muke koe o ageta. Taria janai no. Sa irashai. So ie no iriguchi no hou ni, so in the direction of the entrance of the house, kao o muke, she turned her face towards, in the direction of the entrance of their house, koe o ageta, and raised her voice and yelled, spoke it up said. So yeah, she's thinking dreamily, oh, my son is going to be such a great man when he grows up and she's all being beautiful and radiant and looking like a girl in her teens. And she's like, Ara! like, oh, hey, Ta Talia over there at the entrance of our house. You know, it's just kind of like that. Patron A, oh, Matuta turned towards the house's entrance and raised her voice. So again, raised her voice to me, I usually think of raise, raise one's voice more as like raise one's voice in anger. That's kind of more the imagery that I get from that. I don't know if that's true of everyone else. I would be a little careful with raised her voice. You must be Thalia or Talia. So yeah, patrons A and B, I noticed, chose to romanize uh, Taria as um, T-H-A-L-I-A. That is my cat's name. She's sitting right there. <laughs> so this is my kitty, whose name is spelled T-H-A-L-I-A. And this is a common... Uh, dilemma when you're translating uh, romanized names that are, you know, not Japanese. They're sort of pseudo-Western or actually Western. And I actually got her name. Well, this is the name she came with at the SPCA. It was somewhat kismet. I was planning, though, if I did get a girl kitty, which I did want, I was planning on naming her potentially that name because I've been re-re-reading the Percy Jackson books. And I thought, this is a really cool name. <laughs> I, I think it'd make a cool name for a kitty. So I was thinking either Athena or Talia, which is how I thought it was pronounced at the time when I was reading the books. And then when I got her, I was like, you know what? I want to make sure I'm really pronouncing her name correctly. So I looked it up and two different pronunciations said it's actually pronounced Thalia. And that's how I pronounce it now. Initially, I was like, I don't know if I like that pronunciation. I might just call her Talia anyway, because it's cuter. But after a while, I, I discovered I could call her Lai Lai for short. And then I was like, oh, that really suits her, her personality. So I call her Thalia with that pronunciation. But I know like Talia is also correct. But yeah, I like that choice of spelling it that way because it's like my kitty is in this story. <laughs> but uh, anyway, you must be Talia. Please come in. Um, so you must be Talia is, is wrong. Like, I'm going to go out and say it's flat out wrong because you must be Talia implies that she doesn't know who this girl is at all and like has never met her, but like heard, oh, this girl named Talia was supposed to come visit us today. So you must be Talia. Um, but she knows Talia very well. Um, and it becomes clear in the rest of this little passage. So yeah, you must be Talia. That must be Talia would make a little more sense. Like if she can't necessarily see who's at the entrance, like, ah, that must be Talia. Um, I, I don't, I'm pretty sure patron A wasn't going for her not knowing who, who Talia is. You must be Talia. 
but that's kind of how it comes across if you just read this in English for the first time. Uh, patron B. Oh my! She looked towards the entrance hall and raised her voice. Entrance hall implies that they live in a very grand house and there's like a hall entrance. Ie no iriguchi. It's just like the entrance. The door, pretty much. Uh, entrance hall just implies they live in a really big grand house, which they don't. So I think she looked towards the door and raised her voice. Again, raised her voice. To me, it sounds like she's like angry. <laughs> but maybe that's just me. Let me know if you think Ray's one's voice sounds like in anger or if it's just neutral to you. Well, if it isn't Thalia, that... I'm gonna like mispronounce her name when I see it spelled that way because I'm so used to my cat. <laughs> well, if it isn't Talia, please come right on in. Yeah, I like that. Talia Janaino. It's like Talia Janaino. Like, well, if it isn't Talia, please come right on in. Yeah, that's more the feeling we're getting from her. Patron C. All right, so remember Patron C kind of combined. Ara, matuta ga ia no irigushi no yoni, kao muke, kao ageta, tari hajanai no sa irashai. Combined all of that into like one big, well, one small paragraph. So, oh, if it isn't Talia, she called out towards the entrance, come, come in. I like that. I like how it's like combined into one thing, like a line of dialogue she said, and I'm describing how she said it, and then another line of dialogue. That's more natural how it would be written originally in English. And note how that ara was not isolated in patron C's. It was kind of combined with taria janaino, which isn't necessarily correct. I'll just go ahead and add there in the other patron's defense. Um, it's more like she's gazing off thinking about how her son's gonna grow up to be such a great man, and like ara? Like, oh, wait, I think I see someone over at the door. And then she looks at the door and she's like, oh, why if it isn't Talia, come on in. So combining, oh, if it isn't Talia, maybe wasn't actually the most authentic choice here. It's the cleaner choice <laughs> and I like it just fine and it works, but it might not be as authentic as, as the scene actually is. And patron D. Ayur! Upon hearing the sudden gasp, Matuta turned to greet the visitor. Come on in, Talia! So, patron Demis and understood uh, who exactly was saying Ara, which again, it's just kind of annoying how Japanese uh, novels don't always tell you who's saying what. But yeah, Ara was Matuta, not Talia. Um, so, patron D clearly thought that Talia was saying that. Uh, there's a footnote also that explains this. So, the footnote after that line of di dialogue, Ayur, uh, that this is how patron D has chosen to romanize Ayur. The closest English equivalent I could think of for ara here is wordless gasp, which doesn't really work in prose, so I'll just have her say his name in surprise instead. And this would have been a perfectly fine choice if, if that had been Talia saying ara, but it was not. It was Matuta, so it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever in this context. But yeah, I mean, if it had been Matuta saying that, it would have been a good choice. Um, upon hearing the sudden gasp, she didn't hear a sudden gasp. It was her gasping. So this was completely, again, like this was completely added because uh, Patron D misunderstood who was saying uh, Ara and it, it just kind of affected the whole thing. It kind of snowballed from there. Uh, Matuta turned to greet the visitor. Come on in, Talia. So there's no mention of the front door. It's not necessarily a bad thing. If there's, if there's a visitor, one would assume that she's at the front door and not like creeping in the window or something or just like popping into the room <laughs> with magic. <laughs> So Matuta turned to greet the visitor is also a fine way of expressing she she turned her face towards the entrance to the house. I mean, you could just say she turned to greet the visitor. Come on in, Talia. And come on in, Talia is perfectly acceptable for Sa Irashai. Tobira ni teo kake, sotto naka o no zoki kondeita shoujo ga, hazkashso ni kokunto unazuita. All right, we got another onomatopoeia. I don't think we had any onomatopoeia in the last episode. <laughs> Amazing. So, tobira, door, ni teo kake, so to, to have your hand on the door. Sotto, or like even leaning on the door. Sotto naka o nozoki konde ita shoujo ga. So, the, the girl who was uh, sotto, like softly, gently, quietly uh, peering inside the house from the doorway that she had her hand on. Hazkashso uh, ni kokunto unazuita. So, she shyly. Um, Nodded. Uh, kokunto is, kokun is sound effect for nodding. So kind of like bobbed her head like shyly like, oh. So she's like leaning against the door. So picture it in your mind. She's kind of, she's this little girl. She had been peering in, leaning against the door. And, and she kind of shyly like, okay. <laughs> um, so patron A. The girl who had been quietly peering in with her hand on the door nodded shyly. 
Patron B, holding her hand on the door, she shyly bowed and entered. Patron C, the girl who had one hand on the door, quietly peering inside, nodded shyly. So patrons A and C are more like literally describing the events that are happening. And patron B kind of took out that whole the girl who was leaning against the door and uh, reworded it a little bit and then also added something. <laughs> and patron D took a different approach and split this sentence into two sentences, which sometimes is a really, really smart move to do because Japanese sentences can run on a lot. So patron D did, a girl was peering shyly into the room, comma, her hand still in the front door, period. She nodded deeply enough to hide her face. So the deeply enough to, to hide her face part was added. Um, it's just kind of the way of describing the Hadzka Soni, I would assume. She would nod deeply enough to hide her face because she's shy. I think that's extrapolating a little too much from the data. I think it's fine to just say she uh, she nodded shyly instead of she nodded, comma, deeply enough to hide her face. But yeah, patrons B and D uh, kind of restructured this sentence a bit. Um, so... There's some good in, in, in both of these, or all of these, I should say. There's three of them. So the girl, who had been quietly peering in with her hand on the door, nodded shyly. That works okay. And then patron C, the girl who had one hand on the door, quietly peering inside, nodded shyly. That's a little bit uh, wordy. It could have been tightened up a little bit, which is kind of surprising because patron C is the one so far who's been really tightening things up. Um, it's not necessarily one hand on the door. And tail, tail kake, it's more like she was sort of like... You know, leaning kind of like, mm. not necessarily one hand either. It could have been both. So it's just a little bit like the girl who had one hand on the door, quietly peering inside, not as shyly. It's a little bit like, I'm going to take breaths in between all these thoughts. Versus A, the girl who had been peering in with her hand on the door, not as shyly. It's a little more organized cleanly. Patron B, holding her hand on the door, she shyly bowed and entered. So patron B left out the whole, the girl who was doing these things, which is kind of smart. You'll notice in Japanese prose, they do this sort of thing a lot. They do modifying nouns with a bunch of words that come before it. And sometimes it's better to like change all those words that come before it into just a single adjective or eliminating them all together or making a different sentence out of them. Because otherwise it does kind of sound like the girl who had one hand on the door peering quietly inside nodded shyly. <laughs> Rather, it's just the girl nodded shyly. Um, we're just adding this information about her that she was on the door, um, that she was leaning against the door or had her hands on the door. So what you could do is you could do like one sentence. Like patron D did. About, there was a little girl um, leaning against the door and peering um, quietly inside. Period. And then she shyly nodded. Um, you could separate it that way. Like patron D did. Or you could do what patrons A and C did and did like the girl, comma, all this stuff describing the girl, comma, <laughs> nodded shyly. Um, shyly bowed and entered. It didn't say that she entered um, in the narration, but she does enter. So it's not really wrong that patron B said that she entered. It's not exactly bowed. It's nodded. Uh, Unadzuita. And then holding her hand on the door. It, it's like she, she was already holding her hand on the door. And this implies that like she then holds her hand on the door to perform the action of bowing. So the order of operations are a little off there. More dialogue. <laughs> Matuta says, Ayuru, Taria wa ne, omae no koto o shinpai shite, nando mo nando mo kite kureta no yo. Taria wa ne, let me tell you about Talia here. Omae no koto, so about you, you. Um, o shinpai shite, she was worried about you. Nando mo nando mo kite kureta no yo. She came uh, over and over, she came so many times, um, kureta, uh, for your sake. She was nice and did you a favor by coming uh, to visit many, many times while you were out because she was worried about you. So patron A, Ayudu, uh, Talia was worried about you and came to check in on you many times. Patron B, Ayudu, Talia was really worried about you, you see. She came many times over the last two days to check up on you. Uh, patron C, you know, you know, comma, Ayudu, period. Talia came to check on you many, many times while you were asleep. She was very worried about you. Patron D. Talia's been so worried about you, Ayur, Matuta explained. She's been dropping by day and night, checking on you. So Patron C did the thing that you can definitely do, well, where you kind of rearrange the parts of the sentence. Omae no koto o shinpai shite was in the middle, in the original Japanese, but Patron C put it at the very end. She was very worried about you, and I kind of like that. 
Um, in Japanese, you're kind of leaving the person, the final thought you're leaving the person with is nandomo nandomo kite kureta no yo. She came many, many times. But in this translation by Patron C, the final thought that um, Matuta is leaving her son with is, she was really worried about you. I kind of like that. I think that's like something more we would do in English than like emphasizing that she came many, many times to see you. So patrons B and C get a little more of that, um, Ayu, let me tell you about this girl. She was so worried about you. She came so many times to see you. Isn't she a good friend? <laughs> kind of thing. Patron A is more like, more textbooky. It's like, Ayuru, Talia was worried about you and came to check in on you many times. It's like, I could imagine a robot saying this. I could imagine a butler saying this. Um, but Ayuru, Talia was really worried about you, you see. Um, that kind of adds in a little more like, hey, let me tell you this. Let me tell you about this girl. She came many times over the last two days to check up on you. Uh, to check up on you, to check in on you, same thing. Um, check on you. <laughs> so you got check in, check up, and check on. Uh, instead of uh, just came, which I think is really cool. I think it's interesting that all three patrons, all four patrons, turned just the verb kudu into came to check up on which is what she did for sure. Talia, okay, so you know, comma, Ayuru? I think that maybe miss, is missing a question mark. You know Ayuru? Talia came to check on you many, many times. The way it's written here with the punctuation, it, it almost seems like, well, without the comma, it's like, you know Ayuru. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know, you know yourself. It's, it's a little confusing. I think it needs different punctuation. Like, you know what, Ayuru? Tal Talia came to check on you many, many times while you were asleep. She was very worried about you. I think that's kind of what it's missing. You know what, Ayuru? Question mark. Or you know, Ayuru? Question mark. Let me tell you something, Ayuru. <laughs> okay, and Patron D once again had a footnote for their little section here uh, on the so in italics. You may notice Talia's been so worried about you, Ayur. So let me read you the footnote. I'm trying to give her a teasing tone here about how Talia likes him, since that's what I think the original text is going for. There's probably a better way to wordsmith this. I don't really like explained to describe her speech. And yeah, uh, italics are, are really awesome. And I'm really upset that in most of the projects I work on for gaming, I'm not allowed to use italics. I guess like the programming doesn't support it for the client or whatever. But yeah, italics can be so incredibly useful in translating. They can convey so much like emphasis and emotion. And yeah, it does work here. Talia has been so worried about you, Ayuru. I mean, there, there's also the risk of it sounding sarcastic. Like, Talia has been so worried about you, Ayuru. Like, yeah, stupid girl. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it also does that. Talia has been so worried about you. Uh, really emphasizes that she's trying to say, hey, Ayuru, somebody likes you. <laughs> And and patron D's right with Matuta explained is is maybe a little, you know, not ideal. I mean, it's not bad either. I mean, you probably could find some other verb, uh, you know, one of those many verbs that you can use for for said that that implies, hey, <laughs> I'm suggesting. Uh, Matuta said suggestively. I mean, you could even do an, an adverb there, like Matuta said coyly or Matuta said suggestively or or something like that. I can't off the top of my head come up with a good adverb or verb. Uh, but yeah, I, I think like a good adverb or verb could also do a lot of work there to show, hey, you know, I'm 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 kind of hinting, hey, she likes you. And also, I like that Patron D add, added that little dialogue tag there to kind of break up this line a little bit. Uh, she's been dropping by day and night checking on you. So you know, once again, checking on, check up, check in. Uh, it's really amazing how all four of the patrons translated kite kureta as, as check in or check on or check up. Day and night is, is another one of those examples where it's a bit of a, an over extrapolation. Like it, it does. Yes, the, the, the day and night does imply. Yes, she's been coming many, many times to check on you. Yeah, patrons A, B and C just used many times. Patron C did many, many times. Uh, day and night does that work of many times, except it, it's extrapolating maybe a little bit too much to say, to, to make the bold uh, assumption and claim that Talia came by at night as well. Maybe she didn't. <laughs> uh, maybe it's important that she did not come by at night. We don't know yet. This is just another one of those examples where like it might seem innocent enough to, to add in some extra information that wasn't there originally. But uh, yeah, like I, I don't think it's necessary to add in uh, the night as well, day and night. That's really the only uh, thing I would say about this. And then the next Japanese line, Haha kara kikasareta ayuru wa uh, kimari waru sou ni kutto shita o muita. When told this, Ayuru looked down at the floor uncomfortably. I think 
hearing this, comma, I you looked down at the floor uncomfortably would make more sense with this wording. As soon as he heard her name, I you looked, I you looked down, avoiding eye contact. I like the avoiding eye contact for Kimari Waru Soni, because that paints that picture of he's he's kind of uncomfortable. And like kutto, it's like of like, oh, I gotta look down so I can avoid eye contact kind of thing. I like the avoiding eye contact part. As soon as he heard her name, though, that's that's not really in the original Japanese. It's just as soon as his mom said that. Um, not necessarily her name. And then Patron C kind of added this a little bit as a dialogue tag after the last line. Hearing this, comma, so yeah, um, that was the suggestion I had for Patron A instead of when told this. It sounds a little weird to use passive voice there, just hearing this. Ayudu could only look down embarrassed. I think it's more like he suddenly, like, it's like when he heard, oh, oh shit, Talia's here. <gasps> I gotta look down, embarrassed. <laughs> like she came by so many times to check in on me when I was unconscious and pathetic after that summoning ceremony where for some reason I was the only person in my tribe who passed out. I'm so embarrassed. Um, yeah, it's more like, <laughs> like, oh no, cringe. So once again, patron D did a little reformatting. I put the section that pertains to the Japanese that we're looking at at the moment in the regular pink and then the stuff in the mauve, I guess that color is, the dark pink, uh, is the stuff that actually comes after it. Ooh, spoiler alert. <laughs> but Patron D chose to combine this uh, dialogue tag, I guess, this description of Ayu Ayuru like looking down in embarrassment uh, after his mom said that, uh, transitioning to the next part where uh, the narrator is describing what Talia looks like. So I kept it all together just so it kind of make a little more sense, but uh, for now, just ignore the stuff that's in the dark pink. So her words had Ayudu ex examining the floor as well and definitely not looking at Talia. And then there's other stuff. So two really interesting things here. One, the M dash after well, yeah, we love M dashes around here. Uh, the other interesting thing that Patron D did here is just completely added in and definitely not looking at Talia. And there's a footnote to explain that. So the footnote says, completely invented, just to transition into the description of Talia a little more smoothly. And yeah, that, that is kind of how you'd have to do it if you're combining these two uh, sentences into one big thing like Patron D has done here. And it's not like, this is another case where this is an extrapolation. This is something that's completely added. However, I don't feel like it's adding something that wasn't in the original text. I mean, if he's looking at the floor, he is definitely not looking at Tolia. And uh, the embarrassment, the um, kimari waru soni, the whole, you know, not coolly, not in a cool dashing way, but in a in an awkward and embarrassed way. Um, that part was not in Patron D's translation as the word embarrassed or bashfully, but this and definitely not looking at Talia part does express that actually. It expresses that he's too embarrassed like to look at her. And so I think that actually works really well in this case, this this extrapolation. And now we have a little bit of description about this Talia character. Kururi to another onomatopoeia. Karu wo shita kinpatsu sukito だ、だ、だ、だ、だ、だ、だ、period。カレンな民族衣装を身にまとった人形のような少女タリアは、そんなアイルを見て、はにかんだように顔をほころばせた。and then there's like a little asterisk after that, that it's it's kind of like in English books when you'd have like three stars um, in the center of the page. And that basically notes, okay, we're going to have a scene change and some time passes right after this. So we know that this um, line of narration here, these two sentences are, because they're the last parts of this sentence, they should, this sentence, because they're the last parts of this little section here, they need to be a little poignant, you know, kind of like we're ending this little section here. So I think um, one can really take some time and some care to be a little more poetic with this section, especially since we're describing this pretty little girl, basically. So a uh, kururi is like a curly sound effect. Karu shita kinpatsu, so curled blonde hair. Sukitotta shiroi hada. So I think we had sukitotta in other uh, passages before, and I said clear. Um, that's just kind of a good general catch-all translation for it clear, translucent, um, but it kind of depends on what you are calling skitotta. Um, if it's a skitotta, like sky or something, it's like a clear sky, clear blue sky. If it's skitotta eyes, like hitomi, it's more like clear eyes work, bright eyes work. But if it's skitotta hada, skin of the face, shiroi hada, 
Um, you could almost think of it as like angelic or ethereal. It's just so like clear and white that it, it's almost like this person's a fairy or like an angel or some kind of creature like that. So that's kind of what skitota can mean in this context. Shiroi hada white skin ni aoi hitomi, blue eyes. So she has these springy uh, blonde curls and this ethereal white skin and blue eyes. Karen na minzoku isho. Minzoku isho. Minzoku is a, like tribal um, isho costume clothing. So like um, traditional clothing of their tribe, basically. Karen na is like elegant. Minimatotta. Uh, we went over that in a previous um, episode of this series. Um, that just means um, to wear on your body clothes. Uh, ningyo no yona, um, doll like, basically. Ningyo is doll. Uh, shoujo Talia. So, this girl Talia, who was wearing, like, who looked like a doll, this doll like girl Talia, who uh, was wearing the elegant um, tribal garments, well, the elegant traditional garments of her tribe. Um, sonna ayuru o mite. Um, when she sees ayuru in that state, sonna ayuru, basically, Ayuru is like looking down like that. When she sees Ayuru looking down in embarrassment, uh, Hani kanda yo ni. So Hani kanda is like, <laughs> it's kind of like, kind of shy, embarrassed, like kind of flirty. Um, yo ni, kao hokorobaseta. So kao o hokorobu or hokorobaseru uh, to, to make your face smile, but in better English, smiled. <laughs> <laughs> or like her face filled with a smile, a smile formed on her face, a smile bloomed, I would probably say, because again, this is kind of poetic and we're kind of, we're, we're closing off this section with this final poetic sentence or two about this really beautiful girl. And when she sees him looking down, she kind of smiles shyly. She likes him. <laughs> so patron A. Patron A translated this as curly blonde hair, pale white skin, and blue eyes. I kind of like that. This sort of like, I'm listing things with commas. That that can actually sound pretty poetic. Um, and it's not a complete sentence. And that's kind of how it also is in Japanese. It's kind of dreamy. But again, pale white skin, um, sometimes pale can come across as like pasty <laughs> or like sickly. Again, it's more like ethereal. Talia, a doll-like girl in a lovely traditional dress. It's not a lovely traditional dress. It, it's more like the the lovely traditional dress of their people sort of thing. It's not wrong for sure. But it's like, what, what kind of traditional dress? Whose tradition? Bashfully smiled. Bashfully is really good for Hanikanda. Bashfully smiled. Because it kind of implies like embarrassed, but sort of in like a flirty sort of way. Bashfully smiled when she looked at... Coily would also kind of work well here too. But I'd say bashfully is a little better. Bashfully smiled when she looked at Ayuru. It's more like when she saw Ayuru in that state. When she saw how Ayuru was looking down. Like when she saw him doing that then she, she smiled bashfully in response because, oh, I love him so much. He's so cute when he gets embarrassed. It's kind of like that. Uh, patron B. With her curly blonde hair, clear white skin, and blue eyes, uh, dot, 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 Talia looked almost like a puppet. Not a puppet, a doll. <laughs> so ningyo can mean puppet for sure. In this case, though, no, it, it's a doll. Um, if you say she looked like a puppet, that's implying that, like, She's, she didn't look human. She looked like a robot. She looked like somebody else was controlling her. No, she looked like a doll. Um, I liked the, the first part all the way, like just change puppet to doll. And I really like the wording of that. With her curly blonde hair, clear white skin and blue eyes, Talia looked almost like a puppet. You don't even need the ellipses in that case if you're going to go with with her curly blonde hair instead of just listing the attributes with uh, commas. Uh, Talia looked almost like a puppet. Talia looked almost like a doll. Um, with her charming folk outfit, so Minzoku is folk, that works just fine too. And looking at Ayuru, she shyly bowed at her head. So this is kind of weird. Like, it implies that she's looking at Ayuru with her charming folk outfit. It's like, here, I have my charming folk outfit and I'm going to look at you, Ayuru. Um, it's more like, with a charming folk outfit, like adorned in a charming folk outfit. And you know, here's another, like, just maybe what I would have done. I might have even combined, I might have even tacked the um, charming folk outfit bit onto the part where uh, the narrator is saying that she looked like a doll. Because it comes before she looked like a doll in the Japanese as well. Karen na minzoku isho minimatota ningyo no yona shoujo. So it's like, okay, she's this, like, pretty girl with, like, um, she, with ethereally white skin and, like, 
springy curly blonde hair and these bright blue eyes and she's wearing this like tribal traditional elegant dress girl looks like a doll <laughs> so it's kind of like that i might have tacked the the clothing part also into the description because it's a little awkward if you're like the girl in the in the elegant or charming in this case folk dress looked at ayuru and bowed her head it makes more sense to combine all the physical descriptions into one part and then what she does the action she takes into the second part she shyly bowed her head yeah it's it's more just like she kind of shyly smiles kind of looking down it's not necessarily bowed her head though that implies that she's like showing respect or greeting him it's not that it's more like she's kind of mm, my crush and <laughs> kind of like that uh patron c the girl had curly blonde hair blue eyes and alabaster skin period she looked like a doll dressed in a lovely traditional garb oh dressed in lovely traditional garb um, seeing Ayuru like this, her face beamed with a smile. Again, this is going to be another one of those just like very subjective, this is just how it sounds to me. Garb to me just does not sound at all romantic <laughs> or poetic at all. It's like garb. Um, so I, I personally would not have chosen that word uh, for Minzoku uh, Isho. Yeah, like traditional dress, probably I would have I would have said. There's an illustration a little bit later in the light novel, which again, the patrons are not privy to. Let's see if I can show you guys might be all washed out from my lights it looks okay in the viewfinder but yeah that's talia you can see she's wearing a dress in the illustration so i would have gone out on a limb and just translated that as dress but again like the patrons didn't have access to this image so they wouldn't have known that and you know what if she had been wearing pants then it would have been a mistranslation so it's perfectly fine to say like clothing or costume or uh but again garb in this case it just subjectively to me it just does not sound at all romantic and i think that this passage here sounds pretty romantic and poetic so i i would have it's kind of it's not really a meet cute they know each other but it's like these two characters that are kind of in love um it, we're kind of describing them for the first time interacting with each other so it has to be a little more poetic again maybe it's not fair of me to like say oh it needs to be poetic when the patrons don't necessarily know that because they haven't read the whole book i'm just explaining that now Seeing Ayuru like this, sonna Ayuru mite, it's more seeing Ayuru like that, and then like what, you may say, hanging his head all awkwardly um, at her appearance. Uh, not at her appearance, but at her appearing at their house, at her entrance. Uh, her face beamed with a smile. That's fine. It, it's missing the shyly or bashfully bit. Okay, and patron D, uh, continuing uh, their translation kind of with the last sentence so her words had Ayuru examining the floor as well and definitely not looking at Talia comma or the blonde curls and silky white skin that framed her blue eyes or the charming hand-painted fabric that draped her doll-like form she however was looking straight at Ayuru and beaming through her blush so blonde curls and silky white skin I kind of like the silky even though it wasn't uh, it wasn't described as silky in there, although, I don't know, if I think silky white skin, I, I do tend to sort of think ethereal. You know, kind of like how silk flows in, in the breeze, like like an angel might, that framed her blue eyes. I kind of like that that device, kind of rearranging these adjectives and these descriptions, that it framed her blue eyes. Even though in the Japanese it did not say that, that framed her blue eyes, it, it works well in English to tie everything together so you're not just like listing a bunch of stuff uh, and then the sentence continues this is a run-on sentence <laughs> or the charming hand-painted fabric that draped her doll-like form so the way patron d is is phrasing all of this it's sort of like through ayuru's eyes uh even though i don't know if that was it was actually a really good idea if it was authentic to do this because uh this would not be through ayuru's eyes this is the narrator speaking in a way it's almost like Talia it's like the narrator speaking for Talia because Ayuru is like looking down this isn't ex necessarily like Ayuru like looking at her and taking her in and and noticing all these things about her and that's kind of how this sounds the way it's written it's like Ayuru is, is staring like gazing <laughs> at her and seeing all these things and he's not it's more like this is the narrator describing Talia like I like it I think it's cute and I think it's funny I just don't know if it was quite the way the original Japanese uh, you know kind of intended uh, Karen Na was charming I kind of like that Hand-painted fabric. So Minzoku Isho, hand-painted fabric. That works too, you know, if it's a, if it's a traditional 
costume. It was probably hand-painted, especially back in the day. And then fabric that draped her doll-like form. That's an interesting way of phrasing the fact that she looked, she was this girl who looked like a doll. Ningyo no yo na shoujo taria. And patron D also chose to end the sentence there, chose to put all the descriptive stuff about Talia in the first sentence and then put Talia's actions in the second sentence. She, however, was looking straight at Ayuru. No, she wasn't. She was looking down bashfully. Like, again, I like the way this is all wording. I, I just feel like it's a little too much like a rewrite uh, rather than a translation. Like, like you're taking the plot and characters of the story and just kind of writing your own version of it. Yeah, like the she was looking straight at Ayuru and ble beaming through her blush does get the point across that like Talia likes him and she's shy around him and, and she's happy to see him. But yeah, in the original Japanese, she was she was looking down kind of coyly and flirty and maybe, you know, embarrassed and beaming through her blush. So yeah, I disagree a little with the interpretation here. But it's like, I like the writing. If you completely ignore the Japanese, the writing is good. <laughs> so this is just another one of those cases where you have to be careful. Make sure you're not straying too much from the original Japanese. Uh, but yeah, again, just kind of read the Japanese and picture in your brain what the scene looks like, what the general atmosphere and mood is, and then try to put that into English words that not only mean what the Japanese means, but also evoke um, the same sort of emotional response. All right, so that was it for part five of Let's Translate Light Novels. I hope to see you all in two to three weeks when we go over part six. Bye bye